history. The common bond of fellowship among those who had ushered in a new era of communications led to the founding of the association in 1911. From its inception, there was the realization that pioneering was not solely a characteristic of early telephone development. The only requirement for membership was soon established as 21 years of service in the industry, expressing the concept of pioneering as a continuous process. The industry was then as now, a vigorous growing and changing business, every improvement created the stimulus for further improvements to meet the ever-increasing demands for better and faster communication. And this book goes on, goes on from there and, and is a great, great primer if, if you want to get uh, into the real like nuts and bolts of the history. I'm going to go kind of quickly because it's about 100 years of the history. So um, this is the patent, the original patent that was um, the impetus for uh, Bell beginning to have a service and um, uh, basically the the pioneers um, they'd worked so hard on this system and they wanted to uh, have a way to continue and to continue learning to continue doing what they did. Uh, they had established this thing, this system that nobody really knew very much about. It was mysterious. As I said, Bell didn't really understand electricity uh, when he first developed the phone. He understood sound very well, and, but continued learning and continued progressing. And as the system grew, that was, that was something they wanted to keep alive. And, and that is uh, what I just read. The, the, the part of their mission was to uh, encourage this continuous learning, this continuous process of being engaged in uh, telecommunications and, and, and their hobbies and, and that kind of stuff. So um, this is, this is a, um, uh, an early uh, receipt for your subscription. And this was before there was, this is like some of the earliest subscriber stuff. This is from 1877. Um, and this is the first telephone advertisement. And um, This was the first uh, advertisement uh, advertising uh, tel telephonic systems as a as a service, um, and I think this this is offering the uh, um, the actual uh, ability to contact an operator and and have end to end conversations. This is a little bit later. Um, these were the first workers in the telephone system, and uh, they were young, young people, hackers, people that uh, could, could you know, switch some of the calls as people were starting to um, use telephones uh, for communication with people and, and, and have them in their homes or businesses. But it didn't work out uh, because they, they weren't very good as like, customer service representatives to a lot of the clients, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this picture. Um, I have another one of a cartoon from a little bit later of how the the, uh, the younger men workers would not be as courteous as operators. But these were some of the kinks. They didn't really know how to operate uh, the company as a as a service to people. And and uh, so you know, there's there's some really funny statements on here um, that they're they're careless and. Uh, uh, selfish and that kind of stuff. So they have lack of courtesy and then it's showing uh, the female operators who have courtesy and that kind of stuff and that equals success, of course. So, um, so it's slowly the, the Bell system like began to take off and they, um, they had an initiative. They had like a, a purpose for um, creating an actual company around this invention. So it, it uh, was put into words that they would um, provide this service uh, locally and then ever expanding broad like and, it, and this statement's actually circled it talks about having service throughout the known world um, and uh, so again they're pioneering they, they they're in new territory they didn't ha this wasn't Bell's purpose he just wanted to transmit voice over wires he didn't necessarily envision uh, a, a, a way of like having many subscribers or anything like that he had really good people around him to support the invention and, and create a business that actually sustained itself. Um, so this is the first switch in Seattle. Um, first telephone exchange switchboard that was actually put into service. This is a little later, 1883. Um, and uh, this is uh, Graham Bell opening the Chicago, New York long distance circuit in uh, 1892. Uh, this is really interesting. These are candlestick phones that are left in people's homes that uh, 
you can quickly ring your operator and have your service reinitiated. So um, again, it's like they're just figuring out what are the models, like how do we, uh, how can we expand this network and what is it useful for? None of this stuff was known. It was all new territory. Um, and these were some of the other jobs that people ended up doing. Um, they expanded significantly and created uh, long line systems uh, connecting many, many cities and, and, and uh, ex you know, basically uh, growing their network and, and the, the technology was evolving at the same time. Um, So um, these are some of the plant workers. These are guys that are actually out there building the system. And this is where that fellowship comes from. Uh, it's coming from something that's very new, very uh, mysterious. And again, they don't fully understand what they're doing, but it's slowly growing and becoming a bigger and bigger system. And they start uh, having a lot of employees. And, and out of this invention and this... Uh, um, uh, growth, very rapid growth. I mean, they had to keep up with a lot of changes in, in um, you know, they're competing with telegraph telegraphy, is that right? Uh, telegraphy. And uh, just trying to keep, um, keep pace with themselves, actually. I mean, the innovation just is uh, exponential at a, at a certain point. It just continues to grow. So they had a real culture, like social groups forming, a lot of people um, working together to build the system out. Um, this is particularly in interesting. Uh, as I said, the operators were young guys at first, but uh, that didn't work out because of courteousness. And so they had um, female operators. And um, this is a very like uh, diverse work workforce, but they they each, everybody found spots. And and again, um, I, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, this is a woman, of course, and there is a serious streak of of women working, doing like serious stuff, supervisory roles, managers, like big time within this, this growing company. They're a part of this like pioneer spirit that, that slowly builds up. Um, and even people, again, with disabilities, um, this is a blind operator. Real quick. You know, I'm not sure. I, th I would imagine. I mean, again, they innovated all kinds of stuff. Um, Sure, yeah, yeah, the, they would have flags, and I'm sure they, they adapted it so that she could feel what number and this kind of stuff, but um, try to hold your questions a little bit, because i got to pick up momentum here. I'm already running a little late. Um, so again, this workforce expands. There's, they're um, evolving the system. They have a much bigger switchboard that's, that's um, be coming into use, and many more subscribers, and it, it just uh, continued on from there. So um, these are you know many, many operators, a huge force of women that are... Um, controlling calls and 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 getting people talking to who they're you know who they're trying to get a hold of and uh, and again it's it's a business and it's it's you know that spirit of their um, there to provide the service and you know be loyal to their their subscribers and all of that so um, with this like uh, um, uh, this is another one uh, of uh, a slightly more advanced switchboard. With this, um, they began to um, get a culture, and I kind of like spoke to this a little bit, but that's where um, they wanted to continue. Basically, the, the pioneers came out of uh, people that were leaving the system. They had been there and, and um, been very loyal. They worked for the company. They've innovated. They've done a lot of things. They wanted to keep that, that ingenuity, that spirit, um, and the, just the feeling of you created something that never before existed. This is a very like, new realm, new territory uh, in technology. And so um, they slowly started to build the, uh, the pioneer organization at 1911. It was when it was founded. And, and that provided um, an outlet for people that were leaving. They had been there for 30 years, that kind of thing. So that they could continue um, associating with people that they had built this amazing thing with uh, stay engaged, um, you know, uh, and also serve the community that they had spent their careers in. Um, and there's also a streak of hobby because a lot of these people are tactile. They they had worked with their hands. They had bu built the system. So um, they emphasize that uh, you know continuing your own interests and in, in your own pursuits. And and again, this this organization was basically a, a place for them to uh, to feel still associated, not like they had just left and, and abandoned it. Um, I want to quickly talk about architecture a little bit because these buildings are amazing. Um, and these are uh, a couple pictures of the Seattle buildings that went in. Um, and 
this is what they were building. And, and if you look at a lot of what they wear and, and the architecture, it's, it's a, a really successful business. I mean, it's just beautiful to me. Um, and this history is, is really, really fun to look at. Um, so these are a couple shots of a Seattle office. I like this one, it's $45,000. Um, it's a really nice building for $45,000. Uh, of course, at the time, it was probably a lot of money. Um, uh, and this is, speaks to how robust it was. I mean, the stuff they were building, the way they designed things, they were built to last. And, and I'll get into this with uh, phones and um, other things that, at a later time in the talk, but basically this building you know, uh, continued on. They were able to provide service through a, through a fire and all of that, and actually the air quality was better inside. It's really interesting. Um, and this is a building in New York City, um, which is massive. Yeah. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't say on here. Yeah, very well, maybe. Yeah. All right. We'll continue on here. So here's a an early testing laboratory, and this speaks to that innovation. You know, just what they were doing. They're they're uh, innovating. The the stuff was changing. Um, so these guys just. Um, all had a different position within this massive growing organization. And so these guys, I think, are doing vacuum tubes, repeater tubes. And um, this is a rear view of um, power. Uh, this is in San Francisco. And this is sort of what it takes to power the system. And um, the, 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 the way they design power, it, it, it's a lot of it, some of the basic uh, principles behind it in the telephone system are are so well planned out and, and make so much sense. The the way they install things, it's, it's very similar today. So I'm going to keep going. Um, this is a picture of the introduction of uh, he's testing contact circuits, so like early relay switching systems. Um, and this is a step-by-step -step system. So I, I was speaking a lot about the culture and how it got so big that they needed uh, social groups. They, they started putting out magazines, and that's where a lot of uh, the pictures I just showed you came from, uh, Pacific Telephone Magazine, and um, they're, um, basically a lot of what the pioneers did is keep the old magazines and a lot of the, the old material, and that's where a lot of what I'm showing you right now about the history has come from, and, and that's part of the fellowship and, and their loyalty to the company. They preserve the history and, and, and it's actually still available. You can find these things um, through uh, the pioneers and, and what they do. So these are a bunch of trainees. And you know, you gotta imagine, you're, you're expanding a system like this. You, need, you have to hire tons and tons of people to, to run the system. And, and so here we are with a bunch of ladies who have just been trained. Uh, I think this, this is again in Seattle, because I got this out of um, Pacific Telephone, which I'll get to in a second. Um, they also had social stuff, and, and this is the basketball team. And, and, and this is a small example. There's a lot of examples of this in, in the um, Bell system of people that would, they would have activities, sport, um, softball teams, there were rifle, rifle teams, uh, they would go fishing. Um, and this is where the pioneers started coming in is that um, in addition to retired people, people that have been with the company for 21 years, it's also people that are active employees. Um, and I want to emphasize that here because it's getting much, much bigger. They're, they're doing things as a part of the company. So the pioneers started, they were embracing everybody who was involved. So if you were an active employee and you'd served for 21 years and you were still working with the company, you were allowed to uh, join in and, and become a, a pioneer yourself while you're working for the company. Um, this is Pacific Telephone Magazine cover from 1922. Um, and in the magazine, they started publishing a lot of the activities and a lot of stuff around technology, like what's changing, what's new, what is, um, you know, what's, what's going on, what events are going on, all the, all the stuff that was surrounding this, as I said, socio-industrial 
um, group, these people that had built this massive system um, and sort of charting new territory in the unknown, they were able to trade around kind of, and this is where I get into like parallels between hacker and pioneer, they could talk about all kinds of issues, um, but be that tight-knit community. And so start looking for some of those parallels. And that's why I'm sort of going over the history of the telephone very quickly, because I want to focus on the pioneers um, and, and the cohesion amongst them. So they would have these magazines, and they would um, show events, show different like you know, special interest things. And again, they'd have articles about technology and the business itself. Um, and there were other publications. This is just an example local to, to where I'm at uh, in the Northwest. Um, I put this in here. Uh, this is uh, out of one of the Pacific Telephone issues, and it was, um, I think Bernie S. asked this um, uh, of me on the radio show the other day uh, because he was commenting on uh, the uh, uh, telephotograph. And so these were shots of the telephotograph. And... Uh, and they were published, and, and basically people could read about it and say, oh, you know, this is the new stuff that other people are doing, and it helps that innovation, helps them continue their own innovation or give them ideas. Um, they also talked about lettuce. And, uh, you know, that's an example of things that are, you know, kind of unrelated but in the community. They would have articles about, like, special interests, stuff that wasn't really related, but but they tie it in. They would, it would be news in their, their social group. Um, and then, of course, the uh, vice president. That's sort of industry news. Um, and here's some accident statistics from 1922. Um, actually, this is 1926, so they're talking about 1925. Um, there's also a lot of, like, show stuff, humor, like, levity to keep people uh, engaged and, you know, having fun. And so this was uh, the uh, Seattle Advertising Club. There's some uh, costume ball. So there's a lot of goofiness, a lot of antics in, in the social aspects of, of how the um, people that pioneered our telephone system, uh, how they interacted. So this is just a funny shot I wanted to talk about. Um, and this is a meal card from one of the uh, very first, I'd say about the first decade of the Telephone Pioneer meetings. This was a, um, a printed menu card. Um, again, the, the stylizing, the design, there was a very, it was a very dignified job to work in the, the telephone company. Um, you were doing amazing things. They, everyone dressed very, very well. I don't know. Um, a lot of the plant guys, they were out working very hard, but they all had, you know, nice felt hats. And I mean, they, the guys in the offices or the gals uh, or women, excuse me, that were running the switchboards, they were all in, in very nice uh, full length dresses, that kind of thing. It was a very dignified job. So um, you see the aesthetic in, in some of the history of like how, how seriously they took their role and, and how... Um, you know, loyal they were to it. And, and I don't know, there was just a certain culture that they created over time um, as they were building this, this uh, institution. That statue of Mercury was at the top of 195 Broadway. Really? Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, I came here to learn too. I'm awesome. Yeah, I, um, I love the, the, uh, depiction of him and whenever I see the spirit of uh, communications I, I really like that I, I didn't know that I'm here to learn too I'm by all means I don't know everything about the, the 200 years or 100 years uh, le 100 years leading up to the phone's invention so um, I'm going to get through this and I really want to talk to people and, and find out kind of um, if you have any questions or that that kind of thing but we'll get to that very quickly here um, this was the uh, what we, we talked about this on the radio this was the uh, the cover um, of the proceedings for the Telephone Pioneers of America meeting, um, 10th meeting of the General Assembly, Assembly and 18th meeting total. And this was in 1931. Um, and it took place here at the Hotel Pennsylvania. And I actually, yeah, yeah. I brought, I brought the copy of it. So um, if you're very, very nice, I might let you flip through it, but I'm going to watch you. So um, that's here. Um, and I really love the pen and ink. I mean, this is beautiful stuff to go through. And, and again, it's the pioneers that have preserved a lot of this. Um, and I'll get to that uh, very shortly here. 
because I want to talk about locally, like how I got involved and in, and and my chap, like the chapter in my community, the kinds of things they're doing, because all of you can get involved with what the pioneers are doing, whether you're in telecommunications or not. Um, they're very open and welcoming, and um, I'll stop there and continue with the history. Really, um, really trying to get through this. It's kind of slow. Um, this was Miss Daisy Thomas of Oregon, first woman president of a pioneer chapter. And uh, I really want to emphasize on the ladies because uh, they played a huge part in what the pioneers have done and what they've built. And uh, I think that makes um, this company really, really, really unique. So, um, and I just wanted to end some of the historical stuff, the stuff I got gleaned out of magazines, uh, old magazines. Uh, with this because this is sort of foreshadowing for the future and, and where it's at now. Um, this is an advertisement on the back of one of the uh, Pacific Telephone uh, magazines. It says, Voice Highways, town, yeah, well, ca town, county, or state boundaries are not boundaries of the telephone service, or not the boundaries of the telephone service. Um, every bell telephone is a long distance station, so. Um, how am I doing on time? Does anyone? Perfect. That's good. Okay. So this was an article written in the, the Seattle Times um, about the Museum of Communications. Um, the museum is a 501c3 nonprofit. I think I said that right. Uh, and it is a project of the Telephone Pioneers of America and specifically the, uh, the local chapter. I think it's at the time, it was called Charles B. Hopkins, Chapter 30 of the Pioneers, and this is in Pacific Northwest Territory. It was formerly Pacific Northwest Bell. Um, so there's the article. Um, and this is actually a picture of my local um, central office. This is in Georgetown, Washington, and this is the Duwamish Central Office. And what happened is, um, a, a bunch of guys were sort of getting ready to retire, and one of them was a manager, and they basically were able to convince the telephone company at the time that they, as the telephone pioneers, uh, start a museum uh, with extra space that was being created in the central office because a lot of the telephone system was getting smaller, so they had more space. Uh, and they were able to get the second, half of the second and uh, all of the third floor of this building and the first floor itself is uh, a working central office, um, and it's run by Quest right now, which is probably going to change. I don't know if they got bought yet, but um, so there you go, the museum. Um, and this is early stuff. This is in the first 10 years of the pioneers. This is the kind of stuff they did, that fellowship, loyalty, service. Um, uh, they're making Christmas toys, yes, Christmas toys uh, for needy children. Um, and they've done all kinds of things. There's a lot of projects. Um, I, think, I think on the radio show they mentioned uh, the audio baseballs for um, hearing, it, uh, no, uh, visually impaired. Uh, and they um, also do uh, books on tape for uh, visually impaired people as well. And uh, a myriad of other projects. So this is an early one. And um, basically the last section, last half, I'm going to go through as quickly as I can with um, shots that I did uh, in the museum to kind of take you through what the pioneers have done locally uh, to engage not only people in the tel telecommunications industry, but just in the community in general. All kinds of people go through this museum. So uh, I'm going to try to pick up the pace here. Um, this is an example of the, the Northwest um, workers digging uh, open wire out of the snow. So again, that regional, um, regional uh, need be became a necessity because so many people were involved with the phone system that they had to, um, basically their meetings similar to like a HOPE conference or, or something like, like um, uh, you know, the, the regular yearly meeting, they had to split into general assemblies, and then from there they, they split into chapters. So again, your, your telephone pioneers are, are localized uh, all around the country. Um, not all of them have museums, though, so um, that's a distinction. Um, 
they have everything in this museum that um, they've basically preserved a, a lot of history and and a lot of workers that maybe aren't pioneers or they they um, you know didn't really stay active with the pioneers they they would basically donate stuff and that is how this museum has grown and, and existed so there's some bell stationery there's a lot of tools and a workbench so this is the power system for the uh, the entire museum um, this is the teletype area um, it's an associated press teletype and this is a rare um, Siemens I think it's a um, uh, like a what would you say like a generic brand kind of a, a imitation of um, some of the other brands obviously Siemens is not uh, Western Electric yeah yep yeah so this is what it looks like when you walk in and the museum has every generation of switching equipment and telephone you can possibly imagine represented so um, this is a, a panel um, for the, the uh, Parkway office. This is an old panel switch. Um, this is the number one crossbar that's there. Uh, this is where uh, Bob works. I, I tend to help him a little bit. And this is uh, for the number one crossbar, I believe. And there's a number five there as well. But this is the, the test board, uh, test cart, um, switches on the cart. Um, Andy, who is, he's 92, he's our oldest member um, at the museum. He's working on this North Electric uh, CX100, and this came out of a, a battleship, I believe, and uh, he's trying to get it to work. And he does all kinds of stuff, um, but again, it, it provides an opportunity for him to relate with people that are in the industry, that, that want to talk to some of the older guys, and, and, and basically keep that bond, keep the fellowship alive. Um, and so he's there every Tuesday. Um, this is a tone generator. Uh, <laughs> it makes a certain tone. <laughs> so yeah, um, I helped uh, refurbish this a little bit for the, uh, the multi-frequency multi display. And what you find is that when they get old equipment, they basically want to set up a display so that they can show kids, so that they can show the community, all kinds of people. People in um, tech industry, all the way down to like your Cub Scouts or you know, all, all kinds of groups. They'll, they'll come in, um, you know, maybe guys that just you know, work on the truck, they work with Quest, they want to come in and see stuff. So this is part of the display. This is another tone generator. I don't know which tone this makes, I can't remember. But it's pretty big. Um, this is an example of a, a slightly more advanced teletype system. And this is the uh, 3 ESS that's on the second floor. Slightly more sophisticated. And again, all of these generations are represented there. That's the back of it. Um, Um, this is done by Stephen. He works with the teletypes. Uh, he uh, was involved with uh, SDF, uh, SDF Lone Star, and their original 3B2 is, is actually here on display. Um, and he did this installation. So there's an example of Unix systems there. Um, manuals for that. And this gets into books. There's, there's a lot of books and a lot of things to read. Um, I obviously was able to get magazines to help support the brief history I've outlined here. as sort of a uh, crash course in it. But there's a ton of information at the museum. Um, and it's, it's not the only information there. Um, I, I want to emphasize the, uh, the pioneers themselves as repositories for a lot of wisdom. Um, and that's part of why I got involved. I wanted to understand telephones. I wanted to, to help out a little bit. Um, and the welcoming, the, um, the way they were being with me, the, the, the kind of, um, I don't know, the, the instruction, the, the attitude they had towards a young person trying to understand things, wanting to help a little bit, um, it, really, it really was 
pleasant, and it, and it made me want to come back and help out more. So um, they're very eager to teach people. And again, this museum that they've created is a wonderful environment for that. It's, it's excellent. Um, and so there's other museums around the country, but this is a very unique one and, and a gem, really. Um, there's old, old books and uh, really big books. And this one's really big. Um, it's a storage, I don't know, 6055. I don't know what's in it, uh, but it's huge. Um, there's really tiny books. This is a microfiche catalog. And um, if you look closely, it's made by Diebold. Um, there's some more Diebold. <laughs> Phone books. They have a couple of those. Interesting stations. And they have uh, technical journals, which are very similar to like 2600, zines, that kind of thing. Except a little, yeah, exactly. Th exactly. That's what I was thinking is like, Wow, 2600 is very similar, and and again, there's a lot of parallels. So, um, and they've got a lot of these. Really, yeah. I was wondering, and I wanted to leave time so that people could ask and 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 see, and likewise, if I could find out, like, if some of the stuff has been scanned, because uh, there's a lot of information, which gets into like BSPs. These are ones that Bob and I were using uh, on the crossbar, and um, this is Frank. Um, in the foreground, and they're sitting in front, uh, um, his partner and him are sitting in front of um, the wall of BSPs that are there. Um, and he's working on uh, one of those tape decks I mentioned about, uh, well, for the um, uh, visually impaired, which is, again, another project. And again, they've, they've created this museum to use as a space for teaching about what they do and enrolling people in their organization, but also uh, being a, a resource for the community and um, um, providing service, you know, as and, and not service as in uh, telephones, but like service, like being a service organization in their community where they spent their entire career. This was kind of a funny picture about divesture and stuff like that. So, um, and this is uh, just spare stuff they have. It's just all this uh, wonderful equipment and. Uh, I want to mention that all the switches work, and that's kind of what they're working on, is kind of getting them functioning, uh, getting lines tied in, and connecting them up. Um, so they've got a lot of spare parts for things. Um, this is uh, an exhibit on the types of wire over the generations. Um, newer wire, older, and really new. Um, and then quickly, I'm going to look at some cool phones and then uh, stop and kind of wrap it up and let you guys maybe ask some questions. Um, and I'll get into, um, well, this is a candlestick, some ringers. Um, this is an intercom basically for like an apartment system. It's a vestibule telephone. Uh, this phone is to use... Let's look at this. To prevent ignition of hazardous atmospheres. Uh, oh, oh, that's the warning. Uh, but this is basically for like in a mine or someplace that has uh, uh, fumes that could ignite. I think that's what this one is. Either that or it's bomb proof, but it looks bomb proof. Um, and this is just a funny alarm. Uh, and I put this in here to uh, preface the next photo, uh, which is really funny. <laughs> uh, yes. See, you got to ring the uh, fire bell because, yeah, this one uh, is beyond shop repair. So that is a very melted Model 500 telephone. And um, uh, I probably mentioned this on the shows, on the radio. Um, I went to Dayton and I bought this old phone right here. See, it's real. You can hear the bell. Uh, and I refurbished it at the museum. So... Uh, the guys were really nice. I had like all these pioneers uh, basically offering their help, and we got it all wired up. Um, and they provided a new uh, coil handset uh, cord, and gave me you know 10 feet of uh, shielded pair, and basically cleaned it up. And then I fixed uh, the transmitter and receivers. I swapped in some parts, and this is uh, an example of just how cool they are. They they love to see somebody coming in with a project. You know, like I said, normally I walk around with Bob, and and I try to like learn a little bit more and more every time I go. 
But if I have something that I'm doing at home, anything telephone related, this is, this is the resource. This is what, what they're there for. They know how this stuff works and how, you know, how to explain it in like a really approachable way and, and get, you, get you involved in some of their projects. It's, it's very um, reciprocal sort of relationship. So it's part of the fun that I have there. Um, this is a punch card phone, uh, another example of that. Um, this might, it, yeah, 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 exactly. Sorry, I'm going quickly, I'm trying to save time here. Uh, this, I, I don't know exactly what this is for. Is it okay? Okay. All right. Yeah. See, a lot of the stuff I don't, I don't even know. Um, but I took shots I thought would be interesting. You know. Um, um, this is a recent display they put in a partner system, uh, but you know when they get equipment, if it works and stuff, they'll try to find a display for it so that they can walk around with people and show you know this is an example of this, and and you pick up one end call and and again you can hear the call quality and try to understand and you can actually watch like how how the switching system's working and it's a great way to learn what actually a phone call is. Um, this is like a business phone. This is pretty common in the 80s and 90s. Is that what it is? ISDN? Yeah. This is a, uh, an early radio telephone. And uh, these last couple shots are mobile phones. So um, this is a super car phone. <laughs> it, has a, it has an off switch with a key. <laughs> Which I think we should put in uh, modern handsets. <laughs> so, uh, some cool old Motorola's, and and notice the uh, the the guide uh, with the telephone and the steering wheel. It's kind of interesting. I don't know, I wonder what those instructions are like. Um, and this is International Mobile Telephone Systems, and it's a briefcase phone. Sort of funny looking. Um, and this is another one, Pulsar. Yeah. Um, so those are all the pictures I brought. And um, how are we doing on time? Great. OK, so that's everything I wanted to show. Uh, I just basically uh, wanted to get a chance to speak and, and tell people about the Telephone Pioneers um, and who they've been for me and my community and how I got involved. Um, I stumbled on their website and I started going when the museum was open and um, they're all over the country. There are museums on the East Coast, several on the East Coast and I have um, a directory and uh, um, if you'll excuse my windows here, oh I know it's, it's tragic, yeah, um, these uh, these are as many links as I have um, to get a hold of me. Uh, so I'll take questions real quick. My name's Steve. I'm a pioneer, ex at and Long Lines, ex Bell Labs, ex Wonderful. I belong to an organization called InfoAge, which is a startup science history center in Bell, uh, Wall Township, New Jersey. We are currently starting a telephony museum. Wonderful. So Yes. And we do not have a collection museum. We do not have a telephone club. Got so it. If anybody's interested in this, I am Steve at InfoAge.org. Steve at InfoAge.org. Yeah. And it's I start, I'm cool. Sorry to hide, I'm sorry to hack your meeting, <laughs> but you know, we would like to do the same thing. Absolutely. We, we have space that we're not going to form a CO, so we're starting with some handouts from the closure of Bell Labs Home Dell. Cool. Thank you for coming. Thanks for the announcement, too.
Can you turn that? Can you say that once more? Where can you find operators consoles? TSBS and what? Uh, wow. All over the place. Um, eBay, somebody said eBay. Um, eBay, I mean, you know, maybe, but I'd, I'd suggest like flea markets. Uh, it depends on how old too, because a lot of this stuff was sort of ousted. It, it went the way of, you know, with new technology, the, the, the speed that it was coming in. It okay. Yeah, I mean, look around. The, the stuff is all over, and, and again, you know, technology is changing so quickly. People are getting rid of it. People have it in their garage. Flea markets, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> no, I don't have any pictures of them, and I, I don't know exactly what model you're talking about. Anybody else have a question? In right there. Right. Yes, there's a lot of memorabilia. That's why I... I right, <laughs> exactly. They've got massive soldering irons. Yeah, I mean, they, they were doing a lot of soldering because that's, uh, that's how uh, wire was bundled, uh, outdoor lines at a certain point. And uh, there is a ton of memorabilia. That's why I, I put in uh, two reams of bell paper because there's so many little trinkets and... Uh, uh, souvenirs again you know they would honor people for their service and you would get like you know a pen or buttons you know pins that, that not buttons but pins you know to recognize and share in that accomplishment of loyalty to the company and and building the system that they were all sharing in so um, maybe one more question That's a good question. What kind of impact did the breakup have on the pioneers? The way I see it now, it's, um, it's strengthened them in that they've grown. Uh, they welcome anyone who's been a part of the telecom industry. And um, as it stands now, there's a lot, of, a lot of small companies, a lot of individuals that have started up. And um, we see these, these guys come in, you know, maybe they started, a, uh, you know, some sort of telephone, telecom related company, and they will go through BSPs to find, you know, information on how they can make their systems better, um, and even how they can compete better, uh, which is kind of interesting. So um, I think for the, for the pioneers, it's really good because it's outreach. They're Again, it's a socio-industrial organization, so they're able to interact. They're able to um, to have cohesion as people that are um, involved in in that kind of technology. And I don't know if that's a good answer for it. Um, thank you for coming and listening. <laughs> <laughs>